friends and comrades and welcome back indeed to the MCP channel. Now today's video is somewhat dark and on a very sensitive topic, especially if you've been involved with abuse yourself or have suffered a lot from any of the things mentioned today. So I do advise viewer discretion on this one and if, if you want to give this video a miss and come back next time, I completely understand that and would encourage you to do so if that's going to be something that affects you. So, one thing that I absolutely despise is these fake MLs peddling this sex work is work nonsense. Why is this nonsense? Well, the Communist Manifesto openly proclaims that the Socialist Revolution will do away with prostitution in public and private. Some so-called Marxists, which are actually just biased degenerates, have even come out in support of collectivised brothels under socialism. You probably think about commu communal pornography production too, it's sick, disgusting people. So let's be honest, most of the people spewing this vomit about how prostitution and, and pornography is somehow emancipating for women are Kuma men who are distraught that the socialist revolution wants to take away their porn and their prostitutes and are now trying to have their cake and eat it too by twisting Marxist language of freedom to support their degeneracy and exploitation of the human person. In this, they are assisted by so-called PhD prostitutes who do not represent the vast majority of prostitutes. They are well-off bourgeois women, often holding advanced degrees and are part of the professional managerial class, and they engage in prostitution on the side as a lifestyle choice. We really must tear apart and utterly obliterate the prevalent idea that sex work is work. First, in order to do this, we need to know what work or labour actually is. A worker is not just someone who doesn't own a company and is paid a wage. This is why Netflix employees and other professional managerials are not workers, even though they have a boss, yes they do. But labour is the process by which human beings create and facilitate the use of products of social value. The understanding of class, and thus who is a worker and who isn't, comes firstly from an understanding of how value in society is being produced. At the moment, this is chiefly how it is the capitalist, how he is able to participate in the very cycle of capital, which is MC, M prime, money, investment into commodities, using that money, and eventually more money. Where does more money come from? How is value added so that the capitalist ends with profit? Well, Marx's explanation for the source of these profits is that it stems from abstract human labour inside of the productive process. Profit is not made at the point of selling because value is exchanged for equivalent value. So, you can't be charging far more than everyone else for a given commodity in order to make your profit because then people will simply go and purchase it off a competitor. So when markets are in equilibrium, equivalent values are exchanged on that market. Instead then, if a product for example takes 5 hours to make, then the capitalist may compensate his worker for 3 hours of the value added in the commodity production. This is the surplus value, the source of profit. It occurs inside the production process itself, not out in the markets. And it occurs by not compensating the worker for all of the value that he adds. The worker's labour power produces more value than is required for his sustenance. So the portion of value that is not needed for sustenance is what is taken for profit. It is really the same as labour surplus being taken in any other mode of production in history. Under feudalism, the peasant would organise his own labour and work 60% of the time on producing stuff for his own sustenance, and then after that he'd c carry on working, knowing full well that the rest of it is directly sent to his lord. Under slavery, it's even more extreme, it even more direct. The slave owner provides the slaves with board and food himself, and then takes all of the rest that's produced. 
Now, humans are creative beings and very, very hardworking, so there's always going to be a surplus. The question is, who gets Labour's surplus? And right now, that is not the community, but the capitalist. Now, the trick in here is that the worker does not know the point in the workday at which he's satisfied his needs, beyond which time he's generating surplus for the capitalist. We can't tell when we've satisfied what we need for our sustenance, and when we are surpassing our wage and creating a profit for the capitalists. When we're at work, we don't know when we've reached that point. We get given what we need, but the capitalist gets the surplus. Of course, we know that this is the seed of its own destruction, because as labour becomes cheaper and cheaper, because the capitalist, of course, wants to reduce the, the, how much he's paying the workers, so he pays them less and less, labour becomes cheaper, and the wealth becomes more concentrated in the hands of the capitalists as a result, less and less labour is then needed. But because profits only come from the hiring of labour, profits eventually will fall and collapse. But as things stand now, yes, we do have a proletariat who incidentally are entirely dependent on selling their labour to survive. But the decisive point in what Marx is saying is not that it is receiving a wage that makes you a worker and that just any compensation for a surface makes you a proletariat because you are being paid from someone else. Yes, it's true, workers must get paid to live, but getting paid by a boss is not what makes them a worker. More fundamentally, what makes someone a worker is the creation of value which explains profit, and the falling rate of profit, embodied in the paradox that labour is sold itself as a commodity when it is what is actually produces all commodities. It is the contradiction between the former value and its very material source. Labour is labour when it is responsible for the production of value, surplus value specifically, in Marx's analysis of capitalism. However, even in socialist construction, yes, there will be labour too, as people will create value. It is simply not going to be exploitative labour, and when people meet what is required for their substance, they can choose to continue working, and that surplus is given to the collective instead of an individual capitalist, and is invested in things like infrastructure, healthcare, education, etc, etc, etc. Labour is the source of value. So this does not mean that just because you are not the employer, you are performing produ productive labour responsible for surplus value. Pornography has no social value, nor does prostitution distribute any. Sexual intercourse is not a fundamental human need in the way that food, water, clothing and shelter are. So pornography or prostitution cannot be said to be a commodity to fulfil a need, like everyone must use it for some sort of you know da daily climax or, or else they die. Uh, oh well, yeah, the freaking creamers. They, they act like that's that's the case, don't they? Um, scientists and artists produce value even though they don't give us essential commodities. But intercourse in and of itself is different because it doesn't help us to interpret and understand the world in the way that science and art does. Now, intercourse does take on social value when its purpose is reproduction. In that case, it becomes reproductive labour. And really, the, the pro, um, procreative end must always be present when the marital act is... Um, when the marital act is partaken in, trying to avoid pregnancy and and going against the procreative end is um, utterly immoral. When we believe in the natural law, which is that things are good when they do what the act is ordered towards, which this party does believe in, and we don't believe you have to be religious to think that. But unless you're ignorant of biology, you're not going to say that the sexual act isn't clearly ordered towards procreation. Now, there's also union. The union may, um, increases the strength of the marriage, but the, qu the, re the reason that this is a secondary end is because um, is because it exists to increase the strength of a marriage and this and therefore um, create a stable household environment in which children are to be raised. You see, children of a primary end of marriage. That's what that's what marriage is for. 
Now, even though you need to vent as a secondary end, it is also immoral to um, participate in the marital act without the unity vent. So if you were to um, put a pillow over your wife's head so, such that you can't see her face or make eye contacts, and even positions that, you know, you know, obscure obscure the face and, and visual contact and objectify that, that kind of thing, or masks or, or um, if you, IVF is another example, that is, that separates reproduction from the unitive end. And if, if human reproduction is occurring in a way that is apart from unitive and procreative ends, you know, together, and yes, we also say that is immoral. So you cannot separate union or procreation, but procreation is the primary one to which union serves. That's that's how we view things. That's how we view it ethically. So of course that rules out things like contraception. Um, you know, it, it can arguably rule out things like natural family planning because at least in the vast majority of cases it's used is to avoid pregnancy. You, you even see this, even in certainly in Catholic dioceses as they advertise you know, avoiding children. And if you, this isn't supposed to be a religious video, but if you go, if you read Casta um, it quite, it quite clearly says that the unit, the, the procreative end can never be avoided. So you must always intend to be fulfilling the procreative end. You can't, can't be intending to use marriage and to avoid children, which the user of NFP clearly, clearly does. So, so there, there I mean, there has been, there has been exceptions in the past given by the sacred penitentiary, but these exceptions were always to avoid sin, not to avoid ba uh, not to avoid babies. So if if what if you had a situation where there was the, the other spouse was going to commit adultery or commit onanism or something like that, well, in that circumstance, the circuit the sacred penitentiary allowed it to be used begrudgingly by one spouse against the other, but not with both of them cooperating to try and avoid a baby. So it's basically um, allowing yourself to be sinned against, but it was always to avoid sin, not to avoid baby. And I, I for one, wouldn't be staking my soul on this conclusion anyway, because the sacred penitentiary is part of the Roman Curio, it's, which is a tribunal. It's not an infallible um, body. It's, it's not like all the bishops of the world are gathering for an ecumenical council. So unless what's unless its conclusion is repromulgated in a in an infallible way um, by the Pope, then its conclusion could very well be wrong. And it, you know, eleven of its theologians opposed heliocentrism and banned the publication of heliocentric works. So I'm not going to be staking my salvation on that. But this overall is supposed to be a secular video. So that is an aside, but yes, we believe that both unitive and procreative and chiefly procreative aspects must be there when the sexual act is completed. And we believe only when this is the case, it does take on value. But just do it, the act itself isn't valuable because it's, it's you know, pleasurable or whatever it gives you. It, it's pleasurable to encourage you to procreate, but the value is in the procreation. That's, that's what we call reproductive labour. So, so that any value in the secondary unit of end is of strengthening the marriage. But of course, like we say, this is subordinate because it too exists for the sake of children, for them having a stable domestic situation in which to be raised. However, in prostitution and pornography, both the procreative and the unit of ends actually are obliterated. There is no way for there to be any sort of good pornography or good prostitution under socialism or communism. We cannot have communal brothels or collectivized porn production because both of them reduce the human person to a mere object where they become instrumental, a means to an end of one's own gratification. This is intolerable in the socialist state and in the communist society. By removing the unitive and procreative ends of the sexual act, these perversions mean that sexual intercourse produces no value because it is no longer reproductive labour which is producing value in the sense of children as it would be in marriage in which case yes it does have value and yes it is work our opposition to pornography and prostitution is not merely about it being an exploitative industry it's not merely about vulnerable people being compelled or trafficked into that sick industry although yes that is an absolutely awful factor too that it compounds it and makes things doubly as bad yet 
even if it was entirely consensual and uncompelled, there is still a huge problem. You cannot just remove the bad conditions surrounding it and say that now it's okay. Now, if a capitalist operates under the model of MC, M prime, what is being used as a commodity in the middle of it bef well, bef before the capitalist gets to the final stage of more money? Well, if, if, if in pornography and prostitution, the pimp's getting more money than he started with, it's not something the victims are creating. It's no scientific or artistic work. It's no commodity. Well, the, com the commodity in this sense is their very own bodies. This is disgusting. In pornography, filming the sexual acts, literally, even, even, if it, even if it's a natural marital one, it objectifies and commodifies it. It commodifies it because what is being sold is the human body. No value is being produced in the traditional sense. The body is soullessly distributed apart from any relationship. Same for prostitution too, simply physically and to less people, but it's the same things going on in prostitution as in pornography. Pornography, it just happens more. The unitive aspect of a sexual act is totally removed when pornography is consumed or prostitution engaged with. And of course, if you're masturbating to pornography, the procreative aspect is lost too. And in prostitution, most of the time, contraceptives or simple onanism is employed, which of course pre prevents the procreative aspect too. And yeah, of course, no unions going on there. You just use them and throw them away. So what are we left with? Valueless orgasms. That's what we're left with. Sexual pleasure, apart from marriage, procreation and mutual love. In other words, hedonism. Pornography and prostitution offend the dignity of the participants, the actors or prostitutes, the vendors, and the public. Each one is exploited him or herself or exploits others in some way for personal pleasure or gain. In all, the dignity of a human being, whether it is the person um, posing, uh, the person producing, the person distributing, or the person using, is debased. Finally, those who engage in pornography immerse themselves in a fantasy world, withdrawing from reality. Whilst genuine love always involves a self-giving of oneself for the good of others, and if religious, ultimately for God's sake, pornography is an indulgence of oneself. It entices a person to withdraw from others, actually into a individualist, selfish world of perverted fantasy, which may later be acted out to the detriment of oneself and others. This problem has increased dramatically since the internet offers virtual sexual interaction and increased on-demand frequency of usage compared to um, accessing physical prostitutes, for example. Consuming pornography also leads to addiction, where the need to view pornographic materials leads to a loss of free control of one's own behaviour. Following this comes escalation, where the person delves into progressively harder, more obscure and perverse pornography to attain the same level of sensation and arousal that they did initially. You're never going to get the same hit from watching, um, you know, a video of a normal married spouses, um, you know, just, uh, how to say, um, in a correct position and, and, um, all, 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 all of this kind of thing. It's not, it's not going to feel the same for you. You end up, you end up delving into all sorts of depravity to get that same sense of initial satisfaction. And sick fetishes are hence bred. No one wakes up out of bed for you, you know, with an inclination towards some of those things. They're only developed through the desensitisation um, from pornography. The result is desensitisation, like I say, whereby the user is no longer morally sensitive to the shocking, illegal, repulsive, perverted or immoral quality of the material, but instead views it as acceptable and begins to look upon others as objects and the last and the most dangerous part, acting out, where the fantasizing becomes overt behavior and eventually sexual abuse. I trust that the majority will not be, but if indeed anyone watching this video is using um, pornography, I, I urge you with all of my heart to get off this road to destruction and evil before it is too late for you and for those closest to you in your life. Start now if you're not already free because um, 
You know, not only you will suffer, but you could end up hurting someone else as well. Without question, pornography has a devastating impact upon all of society, especially women and young children. Pornography teaches that women enjoy for well, what they call forced, which is rape, or, and perverse sexual activity, and it advocates prostitution, exhibitionism, sodomy, rape, fellatio, pedophilia, and voyeurism as totally normal behaviour and regards women as sex objects to be used for one's own self-gratification not as a, a fellow human being who you know you 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 want to gr you want to recognize oneself in w without a desire for any any sort of gain not someone that you want to will the good for as a as other you rather they're just an object for your own pleasure for some men the regular use of pornography normalizes aggression towards women in sexual and even other non-sexual interpersonal encounters and unfortunately it increases the general tolerance for such aggression against women in the larger culture. Sadly, the greatest impact is upon the young, especially boys um, 12 through 17 years of age, because pornography portrays sexual activity outside of marriage as acceptable, without the dire consequences of AIDS or other venereal diseases, and it presents this idea of sex apart from the responsibility um, towards conceiving human life which we spoke of earlier as being intrinsic to the act, which leads to huge amounts of unwanted pregnancies and children born into households where they're not loved, they're not wanted, and even worse and more tragically, a huge uptake in abortion. To summarise, prostitution and pornography are not labour as they produce no value. What is being sold as a commodity is the human body. Prostitution and porn acting is the last act of the most desperate and rejected members of society when work isn't good enough. It creates and increases alienation and exploitation of the worst and most repulsive kind. It is sexual slavery, contractual rape. The separation of prostitution and the virtual prostitution of pornography from labour is that the prostitute in capitalist society is the woman who cannot make an existence by labour alone. The prostitute is not even considered a human being like a worker who produces commodities. She's viewed as an object. She's a commodity herself. And of course, the very same commodification occurs in pornography too, um, but more people consume it. That's, that's what the difference is. This is not a true commodity though, because um, as we say, sex is not a human need. There's no, there's no need to distribute pornography and prostitution that people may live. That's not the case. Um, and it's just, it's commodifying something which is not a commodity, which is the human body the hum and the human person. Well, in fact, the personhood of a, per of a person is actually um, diminished. And with the advent of mass pornography, especially in the internet age, the prostitute is no longer just the quote-unquote commodity of just one man, but of millions of men who rape her by proxy. In turn, the pimp's profits are multiplied beyond anything we're ever, ever seeing from regular one-on-one -on -one prostitution. In prostitution and pornography, we see the development of capitalism, the microcosm of sorts, um, the mass dehumanization and alienation of human beings, aimed at smashing our solidarity with one another, leaving us inc increasingly alienated and isolated, viewing one another not as comrades in a common struggle, but vessels, instruments, a means to an end to derive selfish pleasure. People like Vouch who defend either of these two great evils, indeed are disgusting men. They say this not to smash the patriarchy or, or whatever stupid excuse they give, but out of their own interest because they want to commu they want to consume commodified women of themselves. Anyone who de defends the so-called quote unquote sex work cannot be called a communist. They should be humiliated with dunce cap and ink, and they should be sent to do labour. The brothels must burn in a revolution, and every last instance of pornography be utterly blocked, burned, smashed, and destroyed. Socialism will eradicate these scourges on the human race, and uproot the soil that allows alienation to grow between brothers and sisters of this planet, who can no longer even look at each other eye to eye, and see in there a human soul, a comrade, a sibling.
Socialism is going to support marriage and the family, defend strong families, remove artificial restriction on the family, and let them grow beyond belief. And in turn, manufacturing production is going to absolutely explode, and, and consequently the carrying capacity of the population will increase. And this will absolutely obliterate any notions of Malthusianism that may still remain. It's going to be amazing, comrades, but the situation we have now of mass use of contraception, um, shrinking families, in declining populations, populations that aren't even at replace from the shrinking, and, you know, um, broken families, children born into families where they're not loved, children born into families without two parents, is a great strategy of capitalism, and should be to us unceasing motive for us all in the laudable struggle for socialism and communism, communism being the very movement that sublates the present state of things. So, um, you know, comrades, you know, it's not the, it's not a topic that I find particularly easy to talk about, but um, I sincerely believe it's one of the most important that we, we need to be clear about. We shouldn't shy away from this. And it's one of the most, unfortunately, contraception, abortion, pornography and prostitution are some of the most um, prevalent and ugliest results of capitalism so um thank you all for your attention and until next time farewell Yeah.